Hey guys, Michael from JC3 Students here. Just want to give you a heads up that over the next couple of weeks, uh, I'm going to be walking you guys through a series called Explained. In this series, we're going to be talking about the Bible, why it's important, why we should be reading it, uh, why the advice that it gives is something that we should live our lives by, and also what we can do when sometimes it's a little bit confusing. So make sure you tune in each week. I'll be dropping these videos off for the next four Fridays. Make sure you check in and also attached to the email that goes out by our church will be a small group guide that you can either use in your small group settings over the course of this week, or if you don't have a small group or you can't manage to make it to one of those small group gatherings, you can also use these with your parents. Thanks so much guys. Let's get right into it. There is no shortage of things that I wish I understood more. Things that I wish someone could explain the answers to me. Like, why, why can't I lick my elbow? Why is it that that's so hard for humans to do? Or, you know those little things that you can send on your phone or you see on the internet, it's like a picture, but it's like a, it's like a maybe five second clip, right? Is it GIF or is it GIF? And how do we not know by now which one of those it is? Or how does the internet work? How, how can a random assortment of ones and zeros tell Amazon that I want 10 pounds of Starburst delivered to my house? Like, how does it do that? Or what about Carol Baskin's husband? What happened to him? Her, what happened there? There are some things that I just don't no, and while I would love an explanation for so many things, it makes me consider something else that many of us have probably wondered, why isn't this a little bit more clear? And it's the Bible. You see, when it comes to the Bible, we don't necessarily want an explanation. We don't think about it a lot, and when we do, some of us may not really even feel anything spectacular going on. But maybe for you, people talk about it like it's life-changing. Maybe you've been in the church for a while and you've heard people like me or people like Luke or your small group sponsors talk about how the Bible can just change your life so drastically. And if you're being honest, when you read it, you kind of wonder what's going on because it doesn't really feel like anything is really changing for you at all. And you, you read it and you still feel anxious, like the anxiety in your life didn't go away just because you read the Bible. Or you read it and you're still arguing and fighting with your siblings or step-siblings. Or you read it and you still don't have a date to that dance that you really want to go to. Or you read it and you still don't have a boyfriend or a girlfriend. And everyone talks about how life-changing this book can be, but you read it and things don't seem to change in your life. Or maybe you've even heard people who use the Bible as a way of convincing people that they're wrong. Maybe you've heard people say that action that they're taking is wrong and it's wrong because the Bible says it's wrong. And that really confuses you sometimes because it, one person may say that the Bible says that that is wrong and another person may say, well, the Bible actually says that that is right. And suddenly you're left wondering, well, who do I listen to? I'm hearing conflicting messages between people of authority, people who say the Bible says this or the Bible says that, and what do I do with this information? Or maybe the Bible has been explained to you by a bunch of different people in a bunch of different ways, but you should still you just don't get it. And some people look at the Bible like it's a history book 
Some people look at the Bible like it's a weapon that they can use to defend their actions. Some people look at it as it like a cup of coffee. It's a way for them to wake up in the morning. It's the first thing that they do. And it's no wonder that we get confused about the Bible sometimes because we're left wondering what exactly is the purpose of the Bible? What's the point? And what good does it do us in the here and now? What good is the Bible to me as a teenager in my life right now? And I imagine almost all of us have more questions about the Bible than just the ones that I've talked about. There's probably some really personal questions that you have about something that the Bible says or something that you've heard that the Bible says and where it says it and what it means. And you know what? This is a safe place to ask them. You can ask me, you can ask Luke, you can ask your small group sponsors. This is a safe place to get to the bottom because of what I want this this series to be and what I want these next couple of weeks to be is I want this to be a time that you can go to people and you can say, I have questions and not be worried. Sorry, I couldn't quite hear oh, you. Siri. Could you please repeat what you... And, and not be worried about what people are going to say or are they going to judge you or think. This instead, I want it to be a time and a place where we can talk about the Bible and the questions that you have. And let me be the first to tell you, we won't have all of the answers to every question that you have about the Bible. Uh, the Bible is, is so old and it's, it's so dense and there's so much information in there. And uh, even people like me or Luke or John or Bob who have spent uh, so long in our lives studying the Bible still don't have all of the answers. But what I do hope is that as we take a deeper look at the Bible over the next few weeks, we'll be able to walk away with just a little bit more of it explained and why it's so important to those of us who call ourselves Christian. To start off, the Bible is divided into two big sections, and you may already know this, but for those of you who don't, the Bible is the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now, the Old Testament is often what we call uh, the pre-Jesus section. This is a lot of uh, when people in the Bible were what we were called the Hebrew people or the Jewish people. This is before Jesus was born. This section of the Bible, it, it took a lot of, you know, a lot of stories come from this section. Most of the things that you learn in VBS come from this section. Uh, these are stories about God's people and the situations that they find themselves in. And there are a lot of rules and there are a lot of regulations and there are a lot of things that you can do and you can't do. And then we get to the New Testament, and this is, you probably guessed it, the section with Jesus in it. And not just the section with Jesus in it, but the section of Jesus being born, Jesus living his life, Jesus dying on the cross, being resurrected from death, and then Jesus going to heaven. And the latter half of the New Testament is the story of what happens after Jesus resurrects and goes back to heaven. The creation of the church and uh, all the things that we know now in our lives to be associated with Christianity. And, and in reality, the Bible isn't books within books. You may have heard even me or someone else say, you know, the book of John or the book of Matthew. It's actually a combination of a lot of different things. Some of them are like history textbooks, like you have for your history class. Some of them are eyewitness accounts, like uh, we don't really have a lot of eyewitness accounts written down anymore, but we do in video form. We see reporters go to people and say, tell us what happened. And then that person tells the story from their perspective. They say, oh, I saw it all happen here before me. The car ran off the road. And that a lot of what we have in the Bible are those types of things. Eyewitness accounts of people who say, I was there. I saw it. And I decided to write it down to tell you about it. Uh, we have songs in the Bible. Just people sat down and they wanted to sing, and so they wrote down what was important to them and they wrote a song. We have journals in the Bible, kind of like your diary or the journal that you may keep at home where you just write down what you're thinking and what you're feeling and what has happened to you. And we have just a, any number of other types of documents. We have poems, we have all these different types of literature, stories, and that's what the Bible is. It's just a lot of stuff that has been gathered together and put into a book. And with that in mind, I wanted to look at one of the eyewitness accounts. One of the times that someone saw something happen, and they specifically saw something happen in the life of Jesus, 
and they wanted to share it. And so today we're going to look at the Gospel of John. John was a very close friend of Jesus. John was this guy who spent a lot of time with Jesus. They kind of lived together for a while, roamed around the countryside. So think of John like a really good friend of Jesus, someone that you would know, like someone that you went to camp with and you shared bunk with and you know you spent a lot of time with. That's who John is to Jesus. And John starts his account not by telling us what happened with Jesus, but in telling us why it happened. And this is going to sound a little weird at first, but I promise I'll explain. And if you want to follow along, we're going to be reading John chapter 1, verse 1. And it starts this way. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And we're going to stop there because that probably sounds really confusing. And before we go any further, I need to explain that John was Jewish, just like Jesus. Uh, they grew up learning Jewish scriptures. They grew up memorizing most of the Old Testament that we have in our Bible. And when John was talking about the Word, he would have expected people to know what that meant. He would have known that God's Word was really important to Jewish scriptures, God's Word being the things that God had said. He would have known that God's Word had power, that the authority and the spiritual influence of God's Word was important in the lives of the people. It was his essence. It, it represented everything about who he is. God's Word was super important to these people. And God's Word always reflected who God is. When people wanted to know what God's character was like, and maybe you've even thought about this yourself, what are the things that God likes? What are the things that God dislikes? Who is God? What makes him tick, right? And, and we, we do this with the people that we love, the people who are around us. The way that we characterize the people around us are we, we take their characteristics and then we kind of say that's who they are, right? If you have a friend that gets mad really easily, then that's a part of who they are. And so we do the same thing with God. We want to know what his characteristics are. And the way that the Jewish people and even Christians today can figure out who God is and what characteristics he has is by looking at God's Word. And so John starts off his gospel with this, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, because this, this idea of the Word holds so much power, but it goes a step further than that. You see, Jesus is talking, or sorry, John is talking about Jesus when he says the Word. He's talking about what is true. He's saying that the Bible is God's Word, and that the Word is reflected in Jesus. That Jesus was basically a living representation of God's Word. Everything that we learn about the character of God, everything that we know about who God is in the Old Testament, Jesus was the living representation of that. You see, the Word in Jesus, there is no separation. Everything that the Bible says is good, Jesus was, and everything that the Bible said was bad, Jesus avoided or spoke out against. Jesus was God's Word living in the form of flesh. He was a man that was literally the embodiment of God's Word. And the point of the Bible, and I need you to hear this, the point of the Bible from the beginning of Genesis to the end of Revelation, the point of the Bible is to know God better. The whole reason that these stories and collections of eyewitness accounts and poems and songs and all this literature was put together in this one book was it was a way for us to get to know God better. And John takes it a step further. He says in John 1, John chapter 1 verse 14, he puts it this way. He said, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. For we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. You see, the words in the Bible are from God, but Jesus is the ultimate and clearest message from God. God said, you want to know what I mean when I say all the things that I mean? Here is Jesus. Here's a man that will show you how to live your life the way that I want you to. 
And I think that's so important because for us, sometimes we can get so confused and so misled and so convoluted in this idea that we don't know what God wants from us. But in reality, he's already shown us. He gave us Jesus and he said this, this should be the example. This should be the person that you try to live like. This should be the person that you try to be like. And luckily for us, the New Testament recorded so much of Jesus's life that we got to see who he was and how he acted. And then that was our example. That is who we're supposed to be. The biggest job of the Bible is to point us to Jesus. If, if the point of the Bible is to show us who God is, then the biggest thing that the Bible is trying to point us toward is Jesus, because that's who God is. That's who God was in human form. And why does this matter so much? Because Jesus is the best and most perfect representation of God. There's another book called Hebrews in the New Testament, and it says this about Jesus. In Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 2, it says, In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. If you look back in the Old Testament, you'll, you'll see that God used people called prophets to speak his will. But it says, But in these last days, as he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed, heir of all things, and through whom he has made the universe. You see, even Hebrews reflects back to what John is saying in his gospel, that Jesus is, he is the culmination. He is everything that God has said brought together in one place in the form of a man living on the earth. So when you read your Bible, basically what your Bible is trying to tell you, even when it seems confusing, is look at Jesus. Look at Jesus and you'll find who you need to be. Because when we know Jesus better, we know God better. So when we read the Bible, we need to read it with one goal in mind, getting to know God by getting to know Jesus. The more we know about the man Jesus and who he was, the more we'll learn about God and his character. And the biggest answer to the question of what's the point is Jesus. Jesus is the point. He's the reason that our faith exists. He's the reason that I'm sitting here filming this video in this empty room to talk to all of you. Jesus is the point. So let's look at something Jesus said in order to know God better. And after we read it, I'm going to give you three questions to think through that will help you work with the verse. In a conversation with a religious leader, uh, this religious leader would be like a priest or a pastor of the Jewish faith, but uh, they were unhappy with Jesus because they thought Jesus was doing something that was blasphemous or against the the religion at the time because Jesus was kind of acting like he was God and he was but the religious people didn't really like that that much so they were trying to trick him so they ask him this question and it happens in Mark 12 30 through 31 and I'm going to kind of paraphrase it for you the religious leader comes up to Jesus and he says hey of all the commandments of all the rules that God has laid down throughout these centuries uh, which one is the most important now this was a trick because there were something like 615 different commandments. And if Jesus said one was more important than another, then the religious leader would be able to say, oh, well, if you say this one is more important, then you must think that these aren't important, which is a really kind of stupid way to think about things. But it was what he was trying to do. But Jesus knew what was happening. So his response was, uh, the greatest commandment is this, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all of your strength. And then he said, and another equal to the first is to love your neighbor as you love yourself. And this was super important because the religious leader really couldn't weasel out of this because basically Jesus says, if you really want to know what God values as the most important, the first one is love God and have a relationship with him. And the second one is love other people as much as you love yourself. And you might be thinking, well, I don't really like me and I don't really love myself, but that's not true. You take care of yourself. You don't want to feel pain and you don't want to be hurt and all of these things. And basically what Jesus is saying is, is that the truth at the heart of this message is love God and love others. 
So let me ask you these three questions. And these three questions I kind of want you to, to wrestle with this week. And it's how we're going to end today's lesson. The first is, what does this passage teach me about God? This passage that Jesus shares in Mark of loving God with everything that you have and then loving others as you love yourself. What does that teach you about who God is? Secondly, what does it teach you about yourself? What does it teach me about me? What does it teach me about me that the greatest commandments are that I should first love God above everything else and then I should love others? And lastly, what does it teach me about how I need to live or treat others? Am I the type of person that loves God first and foremost and then loves other people? How do I treat other people? How have I treated other people? And do I need to change that in any way? This, this week I would recommend that you guys try to read what John wrote in his gospel and begin by asking those three questions. Type your notes down into your phone, maybe take them with you to the next small group that you have, or reach out to me here at the church. Uh, my phone number is on the website, jeffcitychristianchurch.com. Uh, you can reach me at michael at jeffcitychristianchurch.com. If you have questions, ask me questions. Let me know what you think the Bible is all about.